It seemed to Bigger that no sooner had he closed his eyes than he was wide awake again, suddenly and violently, as though someone had grabbed his shoulders and had shaken him. He lay on his back in bed, hearing and seeing nothing. Then, like an electric switch being clicked on, he was aware that the room was filled with pale daylight. Somewhere deep in him a thought formed. It's morning, Sunday morning. He lifted himself on his elbows and cocked his head in an attitude of listening. He heard his mother and brother and sister breathing softly in deep sleep. He saw the room and saw snow falling past the window, but his mind formed no image of any of these. They simply existed, unrelated to each other. The snow and the daylight and the soft sound of breathing cast a strange spell upon him, a spell that waited for the wand of fear to touch it and endow it with reality and meaning. He lay in bed, only a few seconds from deep sleep, caught in deadlock of impulses, unable to rise to the land of the living. Then in answer to a foreboding call from a dark part of his mind, he leaped from bed and landed on his bare feet in the middle of the room. His heart raced, his lips parted, his legs trembled. He struggled to come fully awake. He relaxed his taut muscles, feeling fear, remembering that he had killed Mary, had smothered her, had cut off her head and put her body in the fiery furnace. This was Sunday morning and he had to take the trunk to the station. He glanced about and saw Mary's shiny black purse lying atop his trousers on a chair. Good God. Though the air of the room was cold, beads of sweat broke into his forehead and his breath stopped. Quickly, he looked around. His mother and sister were still sleeping. Buddy slept in the bed from which he had just arisen. Throw that purse away. Maybe he had forgotten other things. He searched the pockets of his trousers with nervous fingers and found the knife. He snapped it open and tiptoed to the window. Dried ridges of black blood were on the blade. He had to get rid of these at once. He put the knife into the purse and dressed hurriedly and silently, throwing the knife and purse into a garbage can. That's it. He put on his coat and found stuffed in a pocket the pamphlets Jan had given him. Throw these away too. Oh, but, nah. He paused and gripped the pamphlets in his black fingers as his mind filled with a cunning idea. Jan had given him, him these pamphlets and he would keep them and show them to the police if he were ever questioned. That's it. He would take them to his room at Dalton's and put them in a dresser drawer. He would say that he had not even opened them and had not wanted to. He would say that he had taken them only because Jan had insisted. He shuffled the pamphlet softly, softly so that the paper would not rustle and read the titles. Race Prejudice on Trial, The Negro Question in the United States, Black and White Unite and Fight. But that did not seem so dangerous. He looked at the bottom of a pamphlet and saw a black and white picture of a hammer and a curving knife. Below it read a line that said, issued by the Communist Party of the United States. Now that did seem dangerous. He looked further and saw a pen and ink drawing of a white hand clasping the black hand in solidarity and remembered the moment when Jan had stood on the running board of the car and had shaken hands with him. That had been an awful moment of hate and shame. Yes, he would tell them that he was afraid of Reds, that he had not wanted to sit in the car with Jan and Mary, that he had not wanted to eat with them. He would say that he had done so only because it had been his job. He would tell them that it was the first time he had ever sat at a table with white people. He stuffed the pamphlets into his coat pocket and looked back at the watch. It was 10 minutes until 7. He had to hurry and pack his clothes. He had to take that trunk to the station at 8.30. Then fear rendered his legs like water. Suppose Mary had not burned. Suppose she was still there exposed to view. He wanted to drop everything and rush back and see. But maybe even something worse had happened. Maybe they discovered that she was dead and maybe the police were looking for him. Should he not leave town right now? Gripped by the same impelling excitement that had hold of him when he was carrying Mary up the stairs, he stood in the middle of the room. No, he would stay. Things were with him. No one suspected that she was dead. He would carry through and blame the thing upon Jan. He got his gun from beneath the pillow and put it in his shirt. He tiptoed from the room, looking over his shoulder at his mother and sister and brother sleeping. He went down the steps to the vestibule and into the street. It was white and cold. Snow was falling and an icy wind blew. The streets were empty. Tucking the purse under his arm, he walked to an alley where a garbage can stood covered with snow. Was it safe to leave it here? The men on the garbage trucks would empty the can early in the morning and no one would be prying around on a day like this with all the snow and it being Sunday. He lifted the top of the can and pushed the purse deep into a frozen pile of orange peels and mildewed bread. He replaced the top and looked round. No one was in sight. He went back to the room and got his suitcase from under the side of the bed. His folks were still sleeping. In order to pack his clothes, he had to get to the dresser on the other side of the room. But how could he get there with the bed on which his mother and sister were stand were sleeping, standing squarely in the way. God damn. He wanted to wave his hand and blot them out. They were always too close to him, so close that he could never have any way of his own. He eased the bed and stepped over it. His mother stirred slightly, 
Finn was still. He pulled open a dresser drawer and took out the clothes and piled them into a suitcase. While he worked, there hovered before his eyes an image of Mary's head lying on the wet newspaper and the curly black ringlet soaked with blood. Bigger. He sucked his breath in and whirled about, his eyes glaring. His mother was leaning on her elbow in bed. He knew at once that he should have not have acted frightened. What's the matter, boy? She asked in a whisper. Nothing, he answered, whispering too. You jumped like something bit you. I'll leave me alone. I got a pack. He knew that his mother was waiting for him to give an account of himself, and he hated her for that. Why couldn't she wait until he told her of his own accord? And yet he knew that if she waited, he would never tell her. You get the job? Yeah. What are they paying you? Twenty. You started already? Yeah. When? Last night. I wondered what made you so late. I had to work, he drawled with impatience. You didn't get in until after four. He turned and looked at her. I get in at two. It was after four, Bigger, she said, turning and straining her eyes to look at an alarm clock above her head. I tried to wake up for you, but I couldn't. When I heard you come in, I looked up at the clock, and it was after four. I know when I got in, Ma, but Bigger, it was after four. It was just a little after two. Oh, Lord, if you want it to two, then let it be two, for all I care. You act like you're scared of something. Now, what do you want to start a fuss for? A fuss, boy? Before I get out of bed, you pick on me. Bigger, I'm not picking on you, honey. I'm glad you got the job. You don't talk like it. He felt that his acting in this manner was a mistake. If he kept on talking about the time he had gotten in last night, he would so impress it upon her that she would remember it and perhaps say something later on that would hurt him. He turned away and continued packing. He had to do better than this. He had to control himself. You want to eat? Yeah. I'll fix you something. Okay. You going to stay on that place? Yeah. He heard her getting out of bed. He did not dare look round now. He had to keep his head turned while she dressed. How you like the people bigger? They all right. You don't act like you be glad. Oh, Ma, for Christ's sake, you want me to cry? Bigger, sometimes I wonder what makes you act like you do. He had spoken in the wrong tone of voice. He had to be careful. He fought down the anger rising in him. He was in trouble enough without getting into a fuss with his mother. You got a good job now, his mother said. You ought to work hard and keep it and try to make a man out of yourself. Someday you'll want to get married and have a home of your own. You got a chance now. You always said you never had a chance. Now you got one. He heard her move about and he knew that she was dressed enough for him to turn around. He strapped a suitcase and set it by the floor. Then he stood at the window looking wistfully out of the feathery flakes of falling snow. Bigger, what's wrong with you? He whirled. Nothing, he said, wondering what change she saw in him. Nothing. You just worry me, that's all, he concluded, feeling that even if he did not say something wrong, he had to fight her off of him now. He wondered just how to use his, how his words really did sound. Was the tone of his voice this morning different from other mornings? Was there something unusual in his voice since he had killed Mary? Could people tell that he had done something wrong by the way he acted? He saw his mother shake her head and go behind the curtain to prepare breakfast. He heard a yawn. He looked and saw that Vera was leaning on her elbow, smiling at him. You get the job? Yeah. How much you making? Ah, Vera, asked Ma. I done told her everything. Goody, Bigger got a job, sang Vera. Ah, shut up, he said. Leave him alone, Vera, the mother said. What's the matter? What's the matter with him all the time, asked the mother. Oh, Bigger, said Vera tenderly and plaintively. That boy just ain't got no sense, that's all, the mother said. He won't even, won't even speak a decent word to you. Turn your head so I can dress, Vera said. Bigger looked out the window. He heard someone say, ah, and he knew that Buddy was awake. Turn your head, Buddy, Vera said. Okay. Bigger heard his sister rushing into her clothes. You can look now, Vera said. He saw Buddy sitting up in bed, rubbing his eyes. Vera was sitting on the edge of bed with her right foot hoisted on another chair, buckling her shoe. Bigger stared vacantly in her direction. He wished that he could rise up through the ceiling and float away from this room forever. I wish you wouldn't look at me, Vera said. Huh? said Bigger, looking in surprise at her pouting lips. Then he noticed what she meant and poked out his lips at her. Quickly, she jumped up and threw one of her shoes at him. It sailed past his head and landed against the widow, rattling the panes. I told you not to look at me, Vera screamed. Bigger stood up with his eyes red with anger. I just wish you would hit me, he said. You, Vera, the mother called. Ma, make him stop looking at me, Vera wailed. Wasn't nobody looking at her, Bigger said. You looked under my dress when I was buttoning my shoe. I just wish you would hit me, Bigger said again. I ain't no dog, Vera said. Come on in the kitchen and dress, Vera, the mother said. 
He makes me feel like a dog, Vera sobbed, with her face buried in her hands going behind the curtain. Boy, said Buddy, I tried to keep awake till you got in last night, but I couldn't. I had to go to bed at three. I was so sleepy I could hardly keep my eyes open. I was here before then, Bigger said. Ah, oh, nah, I was up. I know when I got in. They looked at each other in silence. Okay, Buddy said. Bigger was uneasy. He felt that he was not handling himself right. You got the job, Buddy asked. Yeah. Driving? Yeah. What kind of car is it? A Buick. Can I ride with you sometime? Sure, as soon as I get settled. Buddy's questions made him feel a little more at ease. He always liked the adoration Buddy showed for him. Gee, that's the kind of job I want, Buddy said. It's easy. Will you see if you can find me one? Sure, give me some time. Got a cigarette? Yeah. They were silent, smoking. Bigger was thinking of the furnace. Had Mary burned? He looked at his watch. It was 7 o'clock. Ought he go over right now without waiting for breakfast? Maybe he had left something lying around that would let him know Mary was dead. But if they slept late on Sundays, as Mr. Dalton had said, they would have no reason to be looking round down there. Bessie was by last night, Buddy said. Yeah? She said she saw you in Ernie's kitchen shack with some white folks. Yeah, I was driving them last night. She was talking about you and her getting married. Huh? How come Gail's that way bigger? Soon as a guy gets a good job, they want to marry. Damn if I know. You've got a good job now. You can get a better Gail than Bessie, Buddy said. Although he agreed with Buddy, he said nothing. I'm going to tell Bessie, Vera called. If you do, I'll break your neck, Bigger said. Hush that kind of talk in here, the mother said. Oh, yeah, Buddy said. I met Jack last night. He said you almost murdered old Gus. I ain't having nothing to do with that gang no more, Bigger said emphatically. But Jack's all right, Buddy said. Well, Jack, but none of the rest. Gus and G.H. and Jack seemed far away to Bigger now, in another life, and all because he had been in the Dalton's home for a few hours and had killed a white girl. He looked around the room, seeing it for the first time. There was no rug on the floor, and the plastering on the walls and ceilings hung loose in many places. There were two worn iron beds, four chairs, an old dresser, a drop-leaf table on which they ate. This was much different from Dal Dalton's home. Here all slept in one room, where he could have a room for himself alone. He smelt food cooking and remembered that one could not smell food cooking in Dalton's home. Pots could not be heard rattling all over the house. Each person lived in one room and had a little world of his own. He hated this room and all the people in it, including himself. Why did he and his folks have to live like this? What had they ever done? Perhaps they had not done anything. Maybe they had to live this way precisely because none of them had, in all their lives, had ever done anything, right or wrong, that mattered much. Fix the table, Vera. Breakfast ready, her mother called. Yes, um. Bigger sat at the table and waited for food. Maybe this would be the last time he would eat here. He felt it keenly, and it helped him to have patience. Maybe someday he would be eating in jail. He was sitting in the room with them, and they did not know that he had murdered a white girl and cut her head off and burnt her body. The thought of what he had done, the awful horror of it, the daring associated with such actions, formed for him for the first time in his fear-ridden life a barrier of protection between him and the world he feared. He had murdered, and he had created a new life for himself. It was something that was all his own, and it was the first time in his life that he had done anything that others could not take from him. Yes, he could sit here calmly and eat and not be concerned about what his family thought or did. He had a natural wall from behind which he could look at them. His crime was an anchor weighing him safely in time. It added to him a certain confidence which his gun and knife did not. He was outside of his family now, over and beyond him. They were incapable of even thinking that he had done such a deed and he had done something which even he had not thought possible. Though he had killed by accident, not once did he feel the need to tell himself it had been an accident. He was black, and he had been alone in a room where a white girl had been killed, therefore he had killed her. That was what everybody would say anyhow, no matter what he said. And in a certain sense, he knew that the girl's death would, had not been accidental. He had killed many times before, only on those other times there had been no handy victim or circumstance to make visible or dramatic his will to kill. His crime seemed natural. He felt that all his life had been leading to something like this. It was no longer a matter of dumb wonder as to what would happen to him in his black skin. He knew now. The hidden meaning of his life, a meaning which others did not see and which he had always tried to hide, had spilled out. No, it was no accident, and he would never say that it was. There was in him a kind of terrified pride and feeling of thinking that someday he would be able to say publicly that he had done it. It was as though he had an obscure but deep debt to fulfill to himself in accepting the deed. Now that the ice was broken, could he not do other things? What was there to stop him? 
While sitting there at the table waiting for his breakfast, he felt that he was arriving at something which he had long eluded him. Things were becoming clear. He would know how to act from now on. The thing to do was to act like others acted, live like they lived, and while they were not looking, do what you wanted. They would never know. He felt in the quiet presence of his mother, brother, and sister a force, inarticulate and unconscious, making for living without thinking, making for peace and habit, making for a hope that blinded. He felt that they had wanted and yearned to see in a certain way. They needed a certain picture of the world. There was one way of living they preferred above all others, and they were blind to what did not fit. They did not want to see what others were doing if that doing did not feed their own desires. All one had to do was to be bold, to do something nobody thought of. The whole thing came to him in the form of a powerful and simple feeling. There was in everyone a great hunger to believe that made him blind, and if he could see while others were blind, then he could get what he wanted and never be caught at it. Now, who on earth would think that he, a black, timid Negro boy, would murder and burn a rich white girl and would sit and wait for his breakfast like this? Elation filled him. He sat at the table watching the snow fall past the window and many things became plain. No, he did not have to hide behind a wall or a curtain now. He had a safer way of being safe, an easier way. What he had done last night had proved that. Jan was blind, Mary had been blind, Mr. Dalton was blind, and Mrs. Dalton was blind. Yes, blind in more ways than one. Bigger smiled silently. Mrs. Dalton had not known that Mary was dead while she stood over the bed in the room last night. She had thought that Mary was drunk because she was used to Mary coming home drunk. And Mrs. Dalton had not, not, had not known that he was in the room with her. It would have been the last thing she would have thought of. He was black and would not have figured in her thoughts on any such occasion. Bigger felt that a lot of people were like Mrs. Dalton, blind. Here you are, Bigger, his mother said, setting a plate of grits on the table. He began to eat, feeling much better after thinking out what had happened to him last night. He felt he could control himself now. Ain't you all eating, he asked, looking round. Go on and eat. We gotta go. We'll eat later, his mother said. He did not need any money, for he had the money he had gotten from Mary's purse. But he wanted to cover his tracks carefully. You got any money, Ma? Just a little bigger. I need some. Here's a half. That leaves me exactly one dollar to last till Wednesday. He put the half dollar in his pocket. Buddy had finished dressing and was sitting on the edge of the bed. Suddenly he saw Buddy, saw him in the light of Jan. Buddy was soft and vague. His eyes were defenseless, and their glance went only to the surface of things. It was strange that he had not noticed that before. Buddy, too, was blind. Buddy was sitting there longing for a job like his. Buddy, too, went round and round in a groove and did not see things. Buddy's clothes hung loosely compared with the way Jan's hung. Buddy seemed aimless, lost, with no sharp or hard edges, like a chubby puppy. Looking at Buddy and thinking of Jan and Mr. Dalton, he saw in Buddy a certain stillness, an isolation, meaningless. How come you looking at me that way, Bigger? Huh? You looking at me so funny. I didn't know it. I was thinking. What? Nothing. His mother came into the room with more plates of food, and he saw how soft and shapeless she was. Her eyes were tired and sunken and darkly ringed from a long lack of rest. She moved about slowly, touching objects with her fingers as she passed them, using them for support. Her feet dragged over the wooden floor, and her face had held an expression of tense effort. Whenever she wanted to look at anything, even though it was near her, she turned her entire head and body to see it and to not shift her eyes. There was in her heart, it seemed, a heavy and delicately balanced burden whose weight she did not want to assume by disturbing it one whit. She saw him looking at her. Eat your breakfast, Bigger. I'm eating. Vera brought her plate and sat opposite him. Bigger felt that even though her face was smaller and smoother than his mother's, the beginning of the same tiredness was already there. How different Vera was from Mary. He could see it in the way Vera moved her hand when she carried the fork to her mouth. She seemed to be shrinking from life in every gesture she made. The very manner in which she sat showed a fear so deep as to be an organic part of her. She carried the food to her mouth in tiny bits, as if dreading it choking up, or fearing that it would give out too quickly. Bigger, Vera wailed. Huh? You stop it now, Vera said, laying aside her fork and slapping her hand through the air at him. What? Stop looking at me, Bigger. Pa, shut up and eat your breakfast. Ma, make him stop looking at me. I ain't looking at her, Ma. You is, Vera said. Eat your breakfast, Vera, and hush, said the mother. He just keeps watching me, Ma. Gail, you crazy, said Bigger. I ain't no crazy in you. Now both of you, hush, said the mother. I'm not going to eat with him watching me, Vera said, getting up and sitting on the edge of the bed. Go on and eat your grub, Bigger said, leaping to his feet and grabbing his pack. I'm getting out of here. What's wrong with you, Vera, Buddy asked. Tend to your business, Vera said, tears welling to her eyes. Will you children please hush, the mother wailed. 
Ma, you oughtn't let him let me treat you oughtn't let him treat me that way, Vera said. Bigger picked up his suitcase. Vera came back to the table, drying her eyes. When will I see you again, Bigger? the mother asked. I don't know, he said, slamming the door. He was halfway down the steps when he heard his name. Say Bigger. He stopped and looked back. Buddy was running down the steps. He waited, wondering what was wrong. What you want? Buddy stood before him, smiling. I, I, what's the matter? Shucks, I just thought. Bigger stiffened with fright. Say, what got you so excited about? All I reckon it ain't nothing. I just thought maybe you was in trouble. Bigger mounted the steps and stood close to Buddy. Trouble, what do you mean? He asked in a frightened whisper. I, I just thought you was kind of nervous. I wanted to help you, that's all. I, I just thought, how come you think that? Buddy held out a roll of bills in his hands. You dropped it on the floor, he said. Bigger stepped back, thunderstruck. He felt in his pocket for the money. It was not there. He took the money from Buddy and stuffed it hurriedly into his pocket. Did Ma see it? Nah. He gazed at Buddy in a long silence. He knew that Buddy was yearning to be with him, aching to share his confidence, but that could not happen now. He caught Buddy's arm in a tight grip. Listen, don't tell nobody, see? Here, he said, taking out the roll and peeling it off the bill. Here, take this and buy something, but don't tell nobody. Gee, thanks. I, I won't tell, but can I help you? Nah, nah. Buddy started back up the steps. Wait, Bigger said. Buddy came back and stood facing him, his eyes eager, shining. Bigger looked at him, his body as taut as that of an animal about to leap. But his brother would not betray him. He could trust Buddy. He caught Buddy's arm again and squeezed until Buddy flinched with pain. Don't you tell nobody, hear? Nah, nah, I won't. Go on back now. Buddy ran up the steps out of sight. Bigger stood brooding in the shadows of the stairway. He thrust the feeling from him, not with shame, but with impatience. He had felt toward Buddy for an instant that he, as he had felt toward Mary when she lay upon the bed with the white blur moving toward him and the hazy blue light of the room. But he won't tell, he thought. He went down the steps and into the street. The air was cold and the snow had stopped. Overhead, the sky was clearing a bit. As he neared the, as he neared the corner drugstore, which stayed open all night, he wondered if any of the gang was around. Maybe Jack or G.H. was hanging out and had not gone home, as they sometimes did. Though he felt that he was cut off from them forever, he had a strange hankering for their presence. He wanted to know how he would feel if he saw them again. Like a man reborn, he wanted to test and taste each new thing to see how it went. Like a man risen up well from a long illness, he felt deep in wayward whims. He peered through the frosted glass. Yes, G.H. was there. He opened the door and went in. G.H. sat at the fountain talking to the soda jerker. Bigger sat next to him. They did not speak. Bigger bought two packages of cigarettes and shoved one of them to G.H., who looked at him in surprise. This for me, G.H. asked. Bigger waved his palm and pulled the corners of his lips. Sure. G.H. opened a pack. Jesus, I sure needed one. Say, you working now? Yeah. How do you like it? Swell. Jack was telling me you saw the gal in the movie you're supposed to drive around. Did you? Sure. How is she? Oh, we like that, Bigger said, crossing his fingers. He was trembling with excitement. Sweat was on his forehead. He was excited, and something was impelling him to become more excited. It was like a thirst springing from his blood. The door opened, and Jack came in. Say, how is it, Bigger? Bigger wagged his head. Hunky-dory, he said. Here, give me another pack of cigarettes, he told the clerk. This is for you, Jack. Jesus, you clover, sure enough, Jack said, glimpsing the thick roll of bills. Where's Gus, Bigger asked. He'll be along in a minute. We've been hanging out at Clara's all night. The door opened again. Bigger saw Gus step inside. Gus paused. Now you all don't fight, Jack said. Bigger bought another pack of cigarettes and tossed it toward Gus. Gus caught it and stood bewildered. Aw, come on, Gus, forget it, said Bigger. Gus came forward slowly. He opened the package and lit one. Bigger, you sure is crazy, Gus said with a shy smile. Bigger knew that Gus was glad the fight was over. Bigger was not afraid of them now. He sat with his feet propped upon his suitcase, looking from one to the other with a quiet smile. Let me have a dollar, Jack said. Bigger peeled off a dollar bill for each of them. Don't say I never gave you nothing, he said, laughing. Bigger, you sure is crazy, Gus said again, laughing with joy. But he had to go. He could not stay here talking with him. He ordered three bottles of beer and picked up his suitcase. Ain't you going to drink one too, G.H. asked? Nah, I got to get. I got to go. We'll be seeing you. So long. He waved at them and swung through the door. He walked over the snow, feeling giddy and elated. His mouth was open and his eyes shone. It was the first time he had ever been in their presence without feeling fearful. He was following a strange path into a strange land, and his nerves were hungry to see where it led. He lugged his suitcase to the end of the block and stood waiting for a streetcar. He slipped his fingers into the vest pocket and felt the crisp roll of bills. Instead of going to Dalton's, he could take a streetcar to a railway station and leave town. 
but what would happen if he left? If he ran away now, it would be thought at once that he knew something about Mary as soon as she was missed. No, it would be far better to stick it out and see what happened. It might be a long time before anyone would think that Mary was killed, and still a longer time before anyone would think that he had done it. And when Mary was missed, would they not think of the Reds first? The streetcar rumbled up, and he got on and rode to 47th Street, where he transferred to an eastbound car. He looked anxiously at the dim reflection of his black face in the sweaty window pane. Would any of the white faces all about him think that he had killed a rich white girl? No. They might think he would steal a dime, rape a woman, get drunk, or cut somebody, but to kill a millionaire's daughter and burn her body? He smiled a little, feeling a tingling sensation enveloping all his body. He saw it all very sharply and simply. Act like other people thought you ain't ought to act, yet do what you wanted. In a certain sense, he had been doing just that in loud and rough manner all his life, but it was only last night when he had smothered Mary in her room while her blind mother had stood with outstretched arms that he had seen how clearly it could be done. Although he was trembling a little, he was not really afraid. He was eager, tremendously excited. I can take care of them, he thought, thinking of Mr. and Mrs. Dalton. There was only one thing that worried him. He had to get to that lingering image of Mary's bloody head lying on those newspapers from before his eyes. If that were done, then he would be all right. Gee, what a fool she was, he thought, remembering how Mary had acted, carrying on that way. Hell, she made me do it. I couldn't help it. She should have known better. She should have left me alone. God damn it. He did not feel sorry for Mary. She was not real to him, not a human being. He had not known her long or well enough for that. He felt that it, his murder of her was more than an amply justified by the fear and shame she had made him feel. It seemed that her actions had evoked fear and shame in him. But when he thought hard about it, it seemed impossible that they could have. He really did not know just where the fear and shame had come from. It had just been there. That was all. Each time he had come in contact with her, it had risen, hot and hard. It was not Mary he was reacting to when he felt that fear and shame. Mary had served to set off his emotions, emotions conditioned by Mary's. And now he had killed Mary, he felt a lessening of tension in his muscles. He had shed an invisible burden he had carried all along. As the car lurched over the snow, he lifted his eyes and saw black people upon the snow-covered sidewalks. Those people had feelings of fear and shame like his. Many a time he had stood on street corners with them and talked of white people as long sleep cars zoomed past. To Bigger and his kind white people were not really people. They were sort of great natural force, like a stormy sky looming overhead or like a deep swirling river stretching suddenly at one's feet in the dark. As long as he and his black folks did not go beyond certain limits, there was no need to fear that white force. But whether they feared it or not, each and every day of their lives they lived with it. Even when words did not sound its name, they acknowledged its reality. As long as they lived here in the prescribed corner of the city, they paid mute tribute to it. There were rare moments when a feeling and longing for solidarity with other black people would take hold of him. He would dream of making a stand against the white force, but that dream would fade as he looked at other black people near him. Even though black like them, he felt there was too much difference between him and them to allow for a common binding and a common life. Only when it threatened with death could it happen. Only in fear and shame, with their backs against a wall, could that happen. But never could they sink in their different hope. As he rode away, looking at the black people on the sidewalk, he felt that one way to end the fear and shame was to make all those black people act together, rule them, tell them what they should do, and make them do it. Dimly he felt that there should be one direction in which he and all other black people could go wholeheartedly. That there should be a way in which gnawing hunger and restless aspiration could be fused that there should be a manner of acting that caught the mind and body in certainty and faith. But he felt that such would never happen to him and his black people, and he hated them and wanted to wave his hand and blot them out. Yet he stu still hoped vaguely. Of late, he had liked to hear of men who could rule others, for in actions such as these, he felt that there was a way to escape from this tight morass of fear and shame that sapped at the base of his life. He liked to hear of how Japan was conquering China, of how Hitler was running the Jews to the ground, how Mussolini was invading Spain. He was not concerned with whether these acts were right or wrong. They simply appealed to him as possible avenues of escape. He felt that someday there would be a black man who would whip the black people into a tight band and together they would act and end fear and shame. He never thought of this in precise mental images. He felt it. He would feel it for a while and then forget. But the hope was always waiting somewhere deep down inside of him. It was fear that had made him fight Gus in the pool room. If he had felt certain of himself and of Gus, he would not have fought. But he knew Gus as he knew himself, and he knew that one of them might fail through a fear at the decisive moment. 
How could he be thinking of going to Ralph's Blum that way? He distrusted and feared Gus, and he knew that Gus distrusted and feared him. And in that moment, he tried to band himself and Gus together to do something. He would hate Gus and himself. Ultimately, though, his hate and hope turned outward from himself to Gus. His hope toward a vague, benevolent something that would help him and lead him. And his hate towards the whites, for he felt that they ruled him, even when they were far away and not thinking of him. Ruled by the conditioning, him and his relations to his own people. 